As we continue with our reading of God's word, we now come to John 21. Listen now for the word of God. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out, got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast your net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the lake. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew that it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Simon Peter said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time, Jesus said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And after Jesus, after this, Jesus said to Peter, follow me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. I really love the stories that we have of the disciples in the scripture after the resurrection. They're such grace-filled stories of God's love for real people um, that comes to us through Christ. On Easter Sunday, we read about Mary Magdalene weeping at the tomb and met in the garden by Jesus. And last week, we read about Thomas and his desire for proof and how Jesus came and stood before him and allowed him to have proof without rebuking him. And then today we have this account of Jesus meeting his disciples on the shore. Now one thing that did occur to me as I studied this passage this week is that this morning some of us may feel a little bit like we've stood with Jesus on this seashore, like really recently. I mean, uh, it was not that long ago, in the middle of February, that you heard a very similar story from Luke 5, read and proclaimed here in worship. One that captures a day on the opposite end of Jesus' ministry, the day that he called several of these same disciples to follow him the first time. It was probably a day just like the one here in John 21, except on that first day, captured in Luke 5, the disciples were fishing like it was their job, because it was their job. Fishing was most likely a family trade for Simon and Andrew and James and John of Zebedee. On that morning, too, they'd been out fishing all night with nothing to show for it. 
Jesus comes along, climbs aboard Simon's boat, asks him to row out a little ways, and he taught the crowd from the shore, you might, or from who were on the shore, you might remember. And when he's finished teaching, he tells Simon to lower his nets one more time. Simon is skeptical, but he complies, and when they pull the nets up, they're so full that they're breaking. And in Luke's gospel at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, remember it's also Simon Peter who has such a big reaction to this miracle. He falls on his knees and he cries out, Go away from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. On that day, the invitation was given and quickly accepted, Follow me and you'll fish for people. And Peter and the others did. Luke 5 says that they brought their boats ashore, they left everything, and they followed Jesus. The next years would take them on a very different sort of expedition, one that involved leaving their families, crowds always gathering around them, miracles and wonders, long walks and boat rides, parables and prayers, people healed, the dead raised, Cana, Jericho, Samaria, Caesarea Philippi, Jerusalem, fig trees and Pharisees, palm branches, tables overturned, an upper room, a basin of water, a chalice and a loaf, a dark garden, an arrest, Peter in the courtyard saying, no, I don't know him, you have the wrong man, I told you, I don't know him, a rooster crowing, then crucifixion, Jesus proclaiming it is finished, the temple veil torn, dark skies and graves opened, a borrowed tomb, silence. Then, light again, faithful women finding the tomb empty, an empty tomb really, a foot race to the doorway, folded linens, confusion, Waiting and praying, Christ appearing one time, then two times. And then Simon Peter looks at the others and says, You know what? I'm going fishing. You know that feeling, probably. I know that feeling, that I don't know what else to do, so I'll do the thing that I know how to do well feeling. It's not just a feeling, it's a coping mechanism. It's what I recommend to people who express that they're feeling overwhelmed or stressed out or out of sorts. What should I do? You should do something that you know how to do well and that you love to do. It's advice that I take myself when I reach that point of overwhelmment or uncertainty. It was just a little over a year ago that I called into the church office where I was employed in Henderson, Kentucky to tell them I wasn't coming in on a Tuesday, hopped in my car and headed to the local Arch Abbey to pray with the monks and wander the grounds with the hope of discerning some pretty big next steps. Where was it that God was calling me next to be a pastor? And that probably just goes to show how different we all are, by the way. <laughs> uh, not everybody should go to an arch abbey <laughs> when you're having that day, you know what I mean? <laughs> For Peter and these disciples, they're going fishing. They know how to fish, at least, or at least they thought they did. Verse 3 tells us this. They went out, got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Nothing. At least some of these disciples are fishermen by trade. They're out of practice, sure. They catch nothing? But then someone appears on the beach. You haven't caught anything, have you? He wants to know. Now the Bible keeps it simple, <laughs> I, but I kind of doubt <laughs> that a boat full of fishermen would just reply no <laughs> to the wise guy on the beach commenting on their lack of fish, but no is probably the gist of it anyway. Cast your net to the right side of the boat, the guy on the shore, who of course we know is Jesus, yells back. Again, I'm a little bit doubtful that this helpful suggestion was met with loads of gratitude, but either way, for whatever reason, the disciples comply. Over the side of the boat goes the net. And they can't even haul it in for all the fish. In your bulletin, you have an outline for this morning, the first point on your outline if you wanted to follow along with that. 
With, with Christ, scarcity becomes abundance. Scarcity becomes abundance. As we keep reading, we'll find out that the disciples are hauling in 153 fish. Too much ink has been spilled about that number. What does it mean, 153 fish? There are scholars who will tell you that in the Bible, the number three means perfection. The number seven is the number of completion. 153 fish, what does it mean? It means a whole bunch of fish. A lot of fish, like way more than the zero that they had a minute ago. And it probably also means that they had um, one of the accountants or tax collectors with them on the boat, probably, <laughs> that tallied that up. But it does symbolize something, though not the numerology of it. It symbolizes the abundant life that they have known as disciples of Jesus. It's reminiscent of the 120 gallons or more of wine filling the water jugs in Cana, of the fish and bread divided among a crowd of more than 5,000 people with baskets and baskets left over. The prologue of John's Gospel says, from his, meaning Christ, from Christ's fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. Grace upon grace upon grace and grace 150 more times. Why 153 fish? Because we are loved so much more than would be adequate for the occasion. We are loved abundantly, and in Christ we have abundant life. Christ does not create scarcity, but abundance. So the disciples are hauling in their net full of fish, and verse 7 says that one of the disciples in the boat, the light has come on. He turns to Peter and says, it is the Lord. And then Peter sprints into action, right? He's putting his clothes back on, he's jumping out of the boat, he's swimming the length of a football field to the shore so he can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Jesus on the beach. When he got into that fishing boat, there's no doubt in my mind that he was feeling so uncertain, so unclear about what the future held for him. Everything was different now. They had followed Jesus, and now he's, where exactly? This must have been all so confusing and exhausting and hopeless. But then, it is the Lord, the disciple next to Peter says, and of course it is. They remember the day when Jesus called them. They remember how he met them at their boats and filled their nets with fish. Suddenly, there's new reason to hope. Point number two on the outline. With Christ, despair becomes hope. With Christ, despair becomes hope. Just when they didn't know what to do next, Jesus is there tugging at their memories of the day that they were called to be his disciples. You know that in that instant, the entire mood on the fishing boat shifted. No longer were they aimlessly floating around, hoping to catch something, anything. Jesus is here, and hope is revived. Now, of course, in that instant, their questions were not all answered. There's still a great deal of uncertainty about the future for the disciples, but they remember that they are called. They have hope in that calling. That's true for us, too. We will not have all of the answers all of the time. We will still face uncertainty about what comes next for us. We may navigate pain and hardship and struggle along the way, but we are never without hope. When we fix our eyes on Christ, when we remember that he has not left us or forsaken us, and when we live as disciples who are called by Christ, we have hope even when there is still trouble and hardship. We can face those difficulties not with despair, but with hope. Here's an important question, for me at least, when I read it. Why does Peter jump out of the boat? The boat that's going to shore anyway. Why does Peter jump into the sea to get to Jesus even faster? Why is it Peter? Because there's something that's been haunting Peter, tormenting him since the night before Christ's crucifixion. 
You're going to deny even knowing me, Peter, Jesus told him at the last meal they shared together. That's ridiculous, Peter had exclaimed. I would never do that. <clears throat> Three times you will, Jesus had assured him. And then it happened. Scared for his own life, for his family, for his friends, Peter had denied knowing Jesus three times. And then Luke 22 tells us when he realized what he had done, he remembered the word of the Lord, and he went and he wept bitterly. Ever make a big mistake that hurts someone else? Ever take an action that causes separation between you and another person? Ever carry around the guilt of that sin, aware of how far you are from where God has called you to be? I have. And that is a heavy load to carry. All that guilt, all that shame. When we get to this morning on the beach, Peter is not just dealing with the existential questions of who am I and where do I go from here? He's also very aware of what he has done and how he has turned his back on his teacher and Lord. But thanks be to God, point number three, with Christ, separation becomes reconciliation. With Christ, separation becomes reconciliation. Jesus isn't going to leave Peter estranged and carrying this burden. And so Jesus says to Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now Jesus had changed Simon's name to the Greek word Petros, which means rock during the course of his ministry. That's where Peter comes from. Jesus gave him that name and said, on this Petros, I will build my church. His given name is Simon. Jesus is using his given name and formal title. Simon, son of John, do you love me? This week, to prepare for my sermon, one of my pastor friends suggested I watch that scene from Fiddler on the Roof. Maybe you know the one where Tevia repeatedly sings to Golda, Do you love me? And she says, Do I what? Do you love me? And she says, I'm your wife for 25 years and on and on, before finally declaring that yes, she supposes she does love him. It can be a perplexing question sometimes when asked between people who have shared so much life together. But Peter answers with no hesitation. Yes, Lord, he replies, you know that I love you. Feed my lambs, says Jesus. And then again, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Tend my sheep, is the reply this time. And a third time from Jesus, do you love me? We can almost read the frustration in Peter's voice. Jesus, you know everything. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep. Jesus tells him. Three times Jesus has asked, do you love me? Three times Peter has responded, once for each instance of denial days before. And then Jesus says the thing about when Peter was young and when Peter grows older, and the gospel writer tells us he's talking about martyrdom, and we're not going to unpack all of that today. But after that, <laughs> Jesus says something very familiar to Peter. Something packed with all sorts of meaning for him. Follow me. What does Peter hear? I think Peter hears this. You, Peter, I'm not done with you. I still have a plan for you. I still choose you as a disciple. I will still build my church upon this rock. Follow me. Why did the word become flesh? To reconcile humanity to God, to span the gap, the chasm, really, that separated us from the one who created us to live in communion with him in all of creation. Just as Peter was separated from Jesus because of his denial, so do we find ourselves separated from Christ because of the ways that we deny knowing him with our lives. 
if that separation were permanent or irreparable, then we would truly be living lives of scarcity without hope. But Christ came that we might have life abundant, that we might have hope in the resurrection, and that we might be reconciled to God through him. Christ meets us in the middle of our despair and calls us again and again and again and again and again, and again, and again to follow him. So I do love these stories of the disciples after the resurrection. I appreciate that the inspired authors chose to leave in details that sometimes don't paint the disciples in the very best light. That must have been a hard decision to agree with. But, but they're so relatable to us modern-day disciples. And I love that these accounts, this one in particular, showcases the grace upon grace that is present in the fullness of Christ. And so this is my prayer for us today. When we are tempted to focus on the things that we do not have, the fish we cannot catch, the lack we might know in any part of our lives, may we focus our eyes on Christ and remember the abundance of love and goodness that he offers us. When we are overwhelmed and we know the depths of despair and uncertainty that comes to us in our lives, May we fix our eyes on Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith, not because then we will have all of the answers and solutions, but because then we will have hope that comes through Christ. When we carry the weight of sin and broken relationships in the sense that we are separated from God and from each other, may we realize that Jesus is walking alongside us, calling us again and again to follow, offering grace upon grace upon grace. And may we recommit to following him every time. Thanks be to God.